Engine performance test two. Engine, I'm sorry, engine performance two test thirteen. Exactly. All of these procedures that can help a service technician diagnose the drivability. Excuse me. All of these are procedures that can help a service technician diagnose a drivability concern, except yeah, cylinder leakage, compression. Fuel level. Thank you, buddy. You good? All right. Grab your, grab, grab, wash your hands and get in here, all y'all. All right. Now then, uh, the last step in the diagnostic process is which of these? Call the customer, check for the technical service bulletins, complete the repair, or verify the repair. You want to be verify the repair? I will tell you this, you're going to run into service advisors that don't like having to call the customer a second time and tell them there's more that needs to be done. And there are some times when you're working on something when you're going to have to complete the first thing you find wrong before you're going to know about something else. It doesn't mean you didn't do it right. It just means that until you get it to this point, well, the service riders, for some reason, a lot of them don't understand that, and they want you to tell them this is going to fix it, and they won't need anything else, right? Yeah. And that's something that I used to really. That's how JT fixes mom truck and then water pump when I can Yeah. So, but you have to verify the repair when you're done, so that you don't. Uh... In other words, if you if you tell somebody that. Uh, you know, this is going to fix it and it won't need anything else. They're going to try to hold you to that and they're going to expect you to do everything else for free, see? And that's something you really got to pay attention to. Yeah. And uh, I worked on a Ford uh, pickup one time. And, and um, there was just all kinds of stuff around. The spark plugs were really old. And I did a bunch of work on the truck to make it idle smooth and run right and all this kind of thing. And uh, it ran right. It did well. And I drove it around. I mean, it was a different truck when I got through. And um, so he came back the next day. You guys listen now. No private conversations while I'm talking. Okay. All right. So um, what's going on is he comes back and he says, sometimes um, I'm losing power and I'm stalling. I didn't experience any of that when I was driving it. But it turned out that the, those particular trucks, uh, like the uh, big Bronco out here, have got a fuel pump in the gas tank that feeds the big pump on the frame. And the one in the gas tank on that truck wasn't running. Well, I had cleaned his old cruddy throttle body and fixed his ignition problems and replaced his bad plug wires. Everything I did to that truck was something he needed, if that makes any sense. Yeah. All right, because it had been not, you know, let go. He hadn't maintained it properly and all that. And so, anyway, he was extremely um, snippy when he came back with this other problem, of course, like I say, truck was a whole lot of miles on it. And I said, uh, I stuck my ear up under there and I unplugged the big pump and stuck my ear up under there and put it in the gas tank and I listened and I, I said, switch on the key and I didn't hear the pump, the transfer pump in the tank at all. Didn't hear it at all. So I said, okay, you're going to have to have the pump in the tank and it's, you know, parts, labor and everything is going to be about another $250. And, and he wanted me to guarantee him that when we put that pump in the tank that he'd never have to buy anything else. Well, I can't help you with that, but I do know the pump in the tank is, is shot, and uh, that's going to fix the truck. But, you know, on, on an 85 model truck that had a 200,000 miles on it that hadn't been maintained, I couldn't guarantee him anything other than the fact that, yes, the pump's not running, and yes, it needs to be replaced. Did you get your ice water earlier? All right. Did I get what? Your ice water? Uh-uh. Because he thinks it's in his office. Oh. What, was you, what were you after? Ice water? Water? Yeah, it's sitting on the desk in there. Was that yours? Mm -hmm. That must be Michelle Goosby. Somebody left it sitting in there. Okay. That green yeah. thing? I thought that was your water. No, this in Yeah, you can put it in there. And take I'm that, sorry, I can't. And yeah. take that ice water to Michelle Goosby. Who's Michelle Goosby? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you were about to do it, weren't you? <laughs> I could have told you that you had carried it to her. Okay. Uh, somebody left their ice water in there. Now, maybe she's probably still hunting it. Um, okay, now then, we've got uh, the last step is verify the repair. Number two is D. The last step is verify the repair. Uh, antifreeze mixed with engine oil can cause which of these? Listen, Casey. Antifreeze mixed with engine oil can cause which of these? Oil becomes thinner, 
all becomes thicker, all congeals, or both B and C? Both B and C. B and C, it makes a mess. And what color is it generally? Brown. By the way, since you found your other piston, have you got your gaskets? No, and I got gaskets there too. Yeah, tell Brett that he's, his gaskets are there and he needs to send them. Okay. Uh, 10.30. Yeah. All right. So, right now we have a smoothly, everybody agrees that it's D, both B and C, it's going to get thicker and congeal. Uh, and it's going to be a sort of a uh, tannish, milky, chocolate milk color, whatever, you know, it's ugly. Uh, a smoothly operating engine depends on which of these. High compression on most cylinders. Compression levels below 100 PSI on most cylinders. Compression levels above 100 PSI or equal compression between cylinders. Is that going to be a D in it? That's going to be a D. So the first one is C and the next three are D, right? All right we'll see if we've got a pattern going here. I reckon. So you got C, D, D, D. So now we're on five. Hmm? You're on number five now, right? A good reading for a cylinder leakage test would be all cylinders above 20%. B, 20% leakage between all cylinders. C, all cylinders below 20% leakage. D, all cylinders above 70% leakage and within 7% of each other. C. Charlie. Yeah, that's going to be a Charlie. All cylinders below 20% leakage. Looks like we do have a pattern going on here. We do, we do, we really do. Engine cranking vacuum should be which of these ranges? Over 25 inches of mercury, 17 to 21 inches of mercury, 2.5 inches of mercury or higher, or 6 to 16 inches of mercury. Okay, so number six should be C. Remember what I told you? 2.5 inches of mercury or higher, that's spinning over. And um, the low oil pressure warning light usually comes on when, let's go to what am I saying? The low oil pressure light usually comes on. Which of these happens? Wow. That's a poorly worded question. Doesn't make sense when you read it, does it? Does it make sense to you all? Does your copy say something that makes more sense than that? The low oil pressure warning light usually comes on. Which of these happens? Uh, does that mean an oil change is required? Mm -hmm. No. It means the I mean, not necessarily. Yeah. We'll go with D. But some cars probably do. The yeah, but they have an oil change. Huh? They have the oil change. They have the oil pressure. Okay, what about uh, the oil filter anti drain back valve opens? Yeah, that's it. He the pressure going through the, the filter stops the pressure. So, what's the oil filter anti drain back valve? Yes, there is one. It's the oil filter bypass valve. Yeah, you got that What would it be? Yeah, I'd say it's C. Now, wait a minute. You're, oh, you're, oh, I see what you're saying. Oil filter bypass valve opens. The oil filter could be clogged up, causing low oil pressure. Okay. Um, Man, we got to be back. Let's, let's make sure we understand the way our question is worded. The low oil pressure warning light usually comes on when which of these happens is what it Pressure drops say. below 4 to 7 PSI. Yeah, pressure drops low 4 to 7 PSI. But what about your oil filter anti-drain back? What's the point in that thing? What's it there for? Do what? The oil filter anti drain back valve. What it is keeps that? the oil from draining back. Like it, you, you know, it pushes the oil filter, filter up through, goes into the head and everything. It keeps oil from running down, running back off so that you don't crank it up as dry. You don't, yeah, you don't have an empty gallery and all oh, that. Okay. That's interesting, isn't it? And that's typically going to be related, it's going to be in the uh, oil filter head up in there. Um, the oil filter, if you, somebody cranks one up and it makes a big rattle and every time they crank it, and it takes you know a second for it to get oil pressure. You know how it does whenever you take in the, whenever you drain the oil out and you put it back in, you crank it up. That old uh, that old Crown Victoria we just did that had like two hundred seventy thousand miles on it. Mm -hmm. When you crank it up, you hear a main bearing for a second, and all that hog washing it takes. That's why I ordered an oil change because my fire line up. I feel you know don't want to idle. Pop the gas in, you'll hear the whole rocker assembly for a second. You gonna put you some motor honey in there too? STP all that kind of thing. Hey, you think that's the reason why? Well, you probably got low oil pressure on that one. Does your oil light come on? No. Nah, that's the one I got 300 Does it work? What? what the oil light work? When you switch on the key without the engine running, does the oil light come on? Well, I ain't really paid too much Better time. make sure you know if the oil light's not telling you the truth, you're going to, you know, be toasty. You're going to be, everything's going to be ruined and destroyed. 
Hello. Hey, Richard. Hey. You working on my car? Uh, which car are you driving? Athletic. Oh, it's already done. It's already done. I didn't realize it. I did not realize that it was supposed to come back to you. I thought they had just brought it. But yeah, it's. No, I'm working over here this week, so I just brought the car to be serviced. Well, we replaced the, we It's serviced. We replaced the grill on it, too, so you'll have a nice shiny chrome grill whenever you're driving back. Okay. Is it at your place? It is. Back right here in the it, it is. It's ready to go. I mean, uh, we're in here in class right now, but, uh, but it's out there sitting by the warehouse. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, it's again. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll just walk out there and get it. All right. When I get ready to go to lunch, okay? Thank, yes, ma'am. That'd be fine. That'd be fine. Okay, All right. thank you, sir. All righty. Wow. All right. Yeah, whatever. All right. But, um, well, you know, I couldn't fault her. I don't usually have class this time of day. Um, anyway, the key's in that car, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I thought it was. Um, so, the low oil pressure warning light, I had a, a Dodge pickup I was responsible for maintaining, and this is a oil pressure deal, uh, and it didn't have all that many miles on it, it probably had 60,000 miles on it, it was a 79 model, and the oil pressure light was started flickering a little bit. Okay, so what do you do about that? It's a company truck, it didn't belong to the, so I put an oil pressure gauge on it that was... Not, you know, the one on the dash, I said, let's just go ahead and run a, a, a pipe up here, you know, for a, a quarter-inch line, and put a Stuart Warner oil pressure gauge on, like you put on your race car, and so we can monitor the oil pressure better while we're driving it, you know, because, I mean, I don't know, know if to trust the light or not. At the time, I just figured we'll just do this, and it was okay. a good, solid instrument, and so that people could watch the oil pressure while they're driving it. And everything was fine. The pressure was a little lower than I thought it should have been, but I really couldn't find figure out what was going on with it because it had always been maintained good. And so they were about halfway back to Port Arthur on it, and the dadgum thing cratered out and started making this horrible racket and just dead in the water beside the road. Sounds like a bearing spun, so it lost over. Didn't spin a bearing. It broke the crankshaft. Mm. The crankshaft was cracked, and it was losing pressure because it was, you know, it was cracked by one of the drilled passages, and that crack, you know, and it, but it that was... It ran quiet, but it just had because the crank would go down in the in the oil and it put losing pressure and it come out. Yeah, and well, it would basically always. You know, it had about seven to ten pounds of pressure, basically what it had when it was idling, and it would go up a little when you would. And I was telling Amanda the rule of thumb for oil pressure is uh, like ten pounds, ten psi per thousand RPM ordinarily. That's usually, and this one here was on the verge of that. But anyway, that broke crankshaft, you know. So usually they're about it was a three eighteen, and I put a three sixty back in it, but. It was, uh, I, I just got a long block and popped it in there, you know. Usually about 40, I don't uh, Huh? Usually yeah, usually, but the minimum rule of thumb. you got to have a minimum. you got to draw a line. Okay. So if you got 10 PSI per 1,000 RPM, you're probably pretty well, that's the lowest it needs to go. You, usually you're going to look to 40 to 60, you know, most of the time. I mean, and I like that. And uh, So anyway, whatever. Um, I wanted to tell you about that uh, while I was thinking about it. Um, and remember the Jeep that I told you about, the guy brought, he bought it, drove it for six or eight or 10,000 miles. First time he changed the oil on it, it was a 2,000 mile Jeep Cherokee. First time he changed the oil on it, the oil pressure went away completely. He had no oil pressure after he changed the oil on it. And so, uh, he took it to L&M Tire over there. Of course, they don't do a lot of engine work, but they, you know, they could get the pan off fairly easy. So they jerked the pan off of it and they popped a, uh, an oil filter on it. But I told Jeff, cause he talked to me about it on the phone. I said, Paul, while you got the oil filter off, Get a rubber tip blower and shove that rubber tip blower up in there where the oil goes and shoot air pressure up in there and see where that pressure goes. And so he, did, he didn't do that. He just threw an oil pump at it. Well, when he threw the oil pump on it, it was better, but it still wasn't right because it was started out with 40 pounds of pressure, but as the car, I mean, as the engine warmed up, it would go back down to where it was like five or six or seven pounds. And so they, he was a military guy, so he brought it over here, we pulled the pan off and pulled the oil pump off, and we shot pressure up in there, and it was just all around the cam bearings. Well, they had told him at another shop, Enterprise, he needed a $5,000 engine. And, you know, every, everybody was throwing him all these high estimates, and so, we, of course, we, didn't, we don't charge labor here, so we pulled the motor out of it and pulled the camshaft out and popped some cam bearings in it and plastic gauged the... Uh, main bearings and the rod bearings to make sure that they were good and everything was fine there. The first thing that starved was the camshaft and it's what wiped out the bearings. But the oil pump was the original failure that caused it all. 
He fixed the oil pump problem. He fixed the oil pump problem, but the damage had been done. So I went for, I mean, I think because of the fact that we don't, that we don't charge labor, you know, a regular shop, you know, would just throw a long block. You know, they wouldn't deal this far because they don't have to guarantee the work. See what I'm saying? We, the, the distinction we have is we don't have to guarantee anything. Now, we don't typically have comebacks, but we don't have to guarantee anything either. So we can get away with, you know, doing stuff other shops wouldn't want to do. And so I'm not throwing off on the other shop. I wanted to put an engine in. You know, he wasn't off base, but this guy couldn't afford to spend that. We're like one of those. And, uh, but anyway, he got away for 250 bucks, basically, because. But we had to pull the engine out and pull the head off and all that to put a cam, uh, Jeff, there in there. One way or another, he had he had a lot of pressure uh, on that. Uh, that was an interesting. I could write a whole bunch of stuff about that video. Uh, so, strategy-based diagnostics is a systematic approach to solving vehicle faults used by GM. Which of these steps is only found in this process? A, check technical service bulletins. B, no published diagnostics. C, preliminary checks or inspections. Or D, verify the repair. All right. And that's number eight. Which one is only found in the system, a strategy-based diagnostics approach to solving vehicle faults by GM? Which one? Which one is it? A, C. And JT is texting on his phone. It's C, right? You know, Miss Graham would throw you out of here if she was sitting in this chair. All right. Now then. What now? You got to say that again? C. What is it? C? Preliminary checks or inspections? Don't you think everybody else does that too? Yeah. All right. What about verify the repair? Does everybody do that? Mm -hmm. Does everybody else want you to check TSBs? Mm -hmm. What about no published diagnostics? GM is really pretty sharp in doing that, and the reason that I'm saying that is because everybody runs across a situation where there aren't any published diagnostics. I can take that little uh, Ford Ranger out there, and I can plant a bug in a particular way, in a particular place, and you can go all the way through the published diagnostics um, that Ford has, and it'll take you to the point to where it tells you to replace the engine controller. <laughs> but you can put another engine controller on it, and it don't change a dead gum thing. You pulled a pin out of it, didn't you? No. I mean, it basically, uh, there is a particular step in there that it will, it's not telling you deep to go deep enough. But I mean, that one particular bug, and I'll probably put that out there on your, uh, as one of your five or six that you have to do. You know how on our finals for our engine performance, we'll put like five cars out there with five different problems? Yeah. And then we'll, uh, and the, you know, the ones that have missed class and hadn't heard my lectures are probably going to crash on their hands on finals because of that, you know what I mean? Because I tell you, there's a lot of stuff I've told you in here that you're going to need to know to pass those finals and all that. So, words to the wise, that's all I'm saying. All right. So, you got to fix five cars. I'll probably do that on, on electronics, too. I'm going to fix uh, four or five different cars with four or five different electronics problems, and you got to go and track those down. Some of them will be scan tools, some of them won't talk to the scan tools, some of them will be codes you got to find, all that kind of stuff. But I think everybody needs to fix four or five cars. If you're going to do a final in some of the more advanced courses, don't you think? Is that a good idea? Everybody like that? I say we got four classes. We you know. have one elect or two electronics, one engine repair, one performance, one emissions. Well, you got brakes, steering, and suspension, and transmissions is what you lack. I say on this file. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to be, uh, uh, you, you'll get pretty well, uh, we're, going to, we're going to get hammered over the next we'll two or three weeks. We're going to do it like we did last year. Yeah. We're, uh, cars, yeah. Four or five minutes. I gotta make sure that we, you know, work you over here pretty hard. Yeah, we gotta have a, a everybody's gotta have a time constraint on this five car thing. Yeah, so you're not gonna be able to just spend all week on it. Um, and uh, and the ones of you that've been through that, who's been through that here? Engine performance one, where you have five cars. You know, you gotta fix. And, uh, did you like that? Was that pretty good? You did it, didn't you, Amanda? I hated it. Today. Yeah, we did it on engine performance one. Remember that when we had no, five cars lined up with five different problems? I don't remember that. Yeah. We don't have it anymore. No. Yeah. But we don't have a hybrid final, do we? Well, if you don't remember it, you will after this semester. Cool. Let's see. All right. So, anyway, let's go on. Uh, no published diagnostics is a thing. Uh, another thing that I was going to tell you about is some of your Toyota stuff is actually uh, really um, disgusting. Because they've got this little matrix, this little trouble matrix. JT's texting on his phone again. He's punching phones. He got that phone in his hand. He's just ignoring me, and he's punching buttons, and he's talking to somebody else. I'm listening to Whoever you. you're texting to, you need to say, I'm in class right now. Do not text me again. Okay? That's what you need to tell them. Okay? Either that or turn off the cell phone. What? 
All right. Which of these smoke types indicates excessive fuel being burned in the combustion chamber? Black. Black. What's a, that's soot or smut and all that, right? Or what would gray be? Blue is what? Oh. White is what? Gray is antifreeze, isn't it? Not really. White is, you know, coolant. I thought gray was kind of antifreeze. There's no such thing as gray smoke. You're not going to find it listed anywhere. It's always going to be black, white, or blue. Define, blue define gray. Blue. If you mix it, maybe if you had, listen, hey, what about this? What if you had soot and antifreeze at the same time? We could mix together and make gray smoke, right? Yes. I suppose. But I don't see that published anywhere. I mean, you know, whatever. Just for whatever it's worth. All right. But anyway, what I was going to say was, on your Toyota stuff, if you look at your Toyota stuff, then you're going to see some silly stuff in here where they're not giving you all that good of diagnostics procedure. In the Hyundai book, whenever we were fighting with those uh, door lock problem, and we determined that this junction box, the relays in the junction box were dropping voltage on that thing, uh, and that junction box was like $700, you know, to fix the door locks for that thing. Is it, what's ridiculous about that? All right. Uh, Ten-year, 100,000-mile warranty sounds good on that. Uh, which of these smoke taps indicates oil being burned in the combustion chamber? This is question number 10. What is that? It's going to be the blue, isn't it? Most mechanical engine problems are caused by which of these? What? It won't be different. Yeah, eleven is going to be A. She's right about that. Um, yeah, that's definitely true. Okay, if you've got a uh, this morning, we had a Oldsmobile, and Amanda walked up and the aftermath of it, so she knows what the answer to that thing is. We have an Oldsmobile that was sitting there this morning, and it was. Uh, Overheating. In other words, this boy uh, that drove it over here is one of my high school dual enrollment guys. He drove the car over here, belongs to a woman that he knows, and she said it, it you know, pushes antifreeze out or blows antifreeze out. And I said, What do you mean by that? It coming out of the exhaust or what? And I just, you know, blows it out of there. And he says, But I drove it over here. He drove it all the way from uh, north of Andalusia over there. Never had a single problem. It was Jeremy. And it was Jeremy. And he pulled it over here and uh, it was sitting here running. And then all of a sudden it starts pushing out antifreeze. Just bump, you know, like the Jeep was doing. Oh, you had a blown hair yesterday? No. Is it like it had a blown hair yesterday? Well, I mean, if, if it's any time it's overheating, it's going to, you know, percolate and push uh, antifreeze over the cap and all that. So what do you do now? I've given you enough information to where you should know where to look. Is the radiator cap uh, open? Well, the radiator cap is going to respond, is going to open when there's too much pressure in there. Right. Okay, what happens What happens whenever you're, you're boiling the water, you're going to build pressure, right? You're going to make air. So it's got too much pressure pushing it into the reservoir? Well, because of what, though? Air. It didn't have any trouble when he was driving it. He drove it all the way over to Mandalusia and never had a bit of spur and it ran, it ran cool as a cucumber. He parks it out here. He's out it running for a little bit, and he's, he's getting finding, trying to find which scan tool. Are the fans working? It's a 92. Oh, it's got a no, fan. the fan wasn't working. That's a good answer. All right, so he's, he didn't have no fan working. So now what are we going to do? Check the, check the relays for the fans. We did, and it was fine. Check fuses for the relays. No, no, fuses no, for the relays. I had good power coming into the relay. Now what are we going to do? Check the wire into the fan. We check the wire into the fan. The fire into the fan is just fine. Ground. We check the ground of the fan. The fan's just right. Bad fan. And how do we know this, though? Because the relays are good. It's getting power to fuse. It's getting power to the relay. The ground's good for the fan. The only thing is, could be not working because it's getting power. So well, we want to verify that. We don't want to just say, we don't say hey, we got a bad fan. That fan is $28. You got $28 if bench. it's the wrong part? Take the fan off and bench test it. Uh, we didn't need to do that. We were, <laughs> we were, we were, we're lazy. We don't want to bench test the fan. We want to do one step that's going to tell us. Right? We want to do one step. Jump power, power right there. Hmm? Jump power straight to the van. Well, I know, but that's the way down there where it's hard to get to. Uh, um, well, unplug it and hook up another fan to it. No, that's too hard to get to, too. It's the same deal. Jesus Christ. What we do? Yeah. Dis disconnect it and see if you've got power at the ends. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to leave the fan plugged in, just like it was. Hook up the scan tool and tell the scan tool to turn the fan on. We can't do that on an two. Oh, yeah. You got to see if you're getting power to the thing. I have told you guys about it. I, well, he's kind of got an idea. Listen, watch this. And this remember, I told you this before. The fan. Yeah. Same wire. Relay. Right. Yeah. We know we got power here. Yeah. Got it. Okay. This right here is B plus. Oh yeah. 
Applied yeah. power. And this right here is PCM. Okay. Okay. This right here huh. is ground. This right here goes to the fan. That's very simple. Sure. Apply the ground to your common and see if the fan comes on. Well, actually what we did was we pulled a relay. And what we did was we hooked over here to B plus with our test lat. And we went right here, like I've told y'all repeatedly. We went right here steps. with our test lat, and we turned the fan through. <laughs> and in all of our turning the fan through, that light would only shift. wink on just yeah. very briefly. One, one of these segments, one of these commutator segments, and only one, okay. was good. Only one. Got it? So now we know we've got a bad fan, and we've done a very simple, easy step. We located the fan relay. We hooked our test light between B plus and the output that's supposed to be going to the fan, and we turn the fan through. That's three, that's three steps. And we three instantly steps. knew we had a bad fan. Three, three steps. You said one step. So, yeah, yeah, there's three. You said one step. Well, I know, but this right here was a lot easier than pulling this off, boot, bench testing the fan. You know what I'm saying? So you are we're trying to do it in a quick and easy way. We did have to discover where the fan was, but as far as actually putting our hands on something, you know, we hooked to the ground, see if we got power here. If we do, we can actually jump power to here, but we're still not sure. So if we turn that light fan through and it kind of the light just comes on very briefly, we know we got one. Judy, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, you did that in here one day with that fan. I did. That's what I keep trying to tell everybody. But I mean, when I'm when I'm trying to get that you get you guys to feed that back to me, everybody's going duh, you know, like we've gone south or something. All right, now then, okay, overheating. The uh, what color is Dex Cool antifreeze when you see a fluid leak? Orange, right? Orange. Orange is good. It is our friend when you got got textual antifreeze. I've never seen red antifreeze or blue antifreeze. There yeah. are some purple antifreezes and yellow and all that kind of stuff. That's cool. European cars. That's what that is. All right. Oh, blue antifreeze in my car. Yep. All right. Now then, uh, let's see. All of these are conditions when a drivability problem can occur except... Rainy or sunny, acceleration and cruiser deceleration, how far it was driven, cold or hot. Rainy or sunny. That is really an interesting question to me. I didn't write that. And I'm thinking that every single one of these could be considered. What do you think? I'm thinking yes. Well, Actually, the right answer, according to the answer key, is C. But don't you think how far it driven, how far it's driven, could be a, a yeah, factor? Yeah, drive a mile versus a hundred miles. Yeah. Or yeah, if you're driving it, I have to. Uh, a lot of times, customer will come and say, "I had to drive it all the way from here to Dothan before it'll do it." Yeah. And I've seen them say, "I have to drive it on the interstate 150 miles before it'll ever act up." If somebody told me that, I probably just. Uh, and later she went down a, a dirt road on that piece of food. Can you imagine it? This is a 91. It doesn't have a crank set. All right. These questions are for from, from chapter 26. The low oil pressure warning light. What, this is dumb. We've already done this one. Hey, just give you give yourself a, a, a good uh, grade on number 14 because that question for some reason went up in here twice. The chemical abbreviation CO stands for what? Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. Now, have any of you guys ever ever encountered any? Uh, oh, have you ever encountered any? Uh, dihydrogen monoxide. No. Uh, is that a peroxide? That's water. Oh. Yeah, it's actually... <laughs> Listen to Amanda. Really, really <laughs> yeah. Dihydrogen monoxide is water. There's a website you can go to that tells you of all the dangers of dihydrogen monoxide, how it can kill people, how it corrodes things. Then you go get a bottle yeah. of water. And it will scare you silly if you read it. Oh, I need to stay away from that stuff. But see, she knew as soon as I put it up there because of the knowing what these words meant, that that is what? What is that? Monoxide's... Uh, o3. Dihydrogen monoxide. It's hydrogen. Dihydrogen monoxide. Two hydrogen molecules per. And that is. Bad. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> two hydrogen molecules. One oxygen molecule is. Explosion. Uh, 
Is it explosive? Um, it says it's explosive. Yeah, it says it's explosive. Hydrogen's explosive, and so is oxygen. Yeah. Boom. Yeah, boom. It's H2O. Helium make you talk like a boy. Wait. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you leave the class to go pay for your head gasket system. <laughs> no problem. All right. All right. Making me feel stupid. <laughs> well, let me take this. <laughs> No. Hey, we're having a late class session today. That's why I didn't answer a while ago. Okay. All right. Um, now then, let's watch this. Number 16 is a repeated question, too. Uh, yep, exactly. Uh, fuel level is something. And I'm going to tell you, I don't really like that either because fuel level can have, can be important. Um, the, the woman, remember I told you, she called, she calls me up out there. We had actually pulled her, uh, we'd replaced a fuel pump in her Explorer, and she called me about, um, three or four days later. She lives in Andalusia, works in Enterprise at Dolphin Junior High. And she calls me and says, my truck is out here at this church right outside of Op, sitting there and quit running on me, and all that. And I, and they have, when they put the gas, to, uh, the fuel pump back in there, they indexed it wrong so that the, the float was, you know, fouled. And it was always reading three quarters of the tank. And bless her heart, she's blind. So she just drives and drives and drives. <laughs> she just, with all due respect, she just drives and drives and drives. She goes, man, I'm getting really good, good gas mileage this week. I'm not needing any. <laughs> and she told me that. She said, I thought I was really getting great gas mileage. That y'all was playing the pump. And then all of a sudden she putters along and it quits. And I go out here and turn on the key and I hear the pump. And I go out here and I mash the little Schrader. It goes, Phew. <laughs> in there, and it's only pulling one and a half amps. I said, "Well, you got to put some fuel in." So I got a gallon of gas and poured it in and drove it over here. Made everybody pull the tank out. I mean, you know, it's just a, it was a mistake we made. So, that was, but what I'm saying is, fuel level, fuel level is an important <laughs> issue when drivability is concerned. You know, here's another thing. Listen to this. Here's another. Here's another deal. Let's say that we're working on a vehicle that has a fuel pump that's having to draw fuel out of the tank, and let's say that. We know that it's got a good sending unit for whatever reason. I don't know how we know, but let's say that we do know it's got a good fuel sending unit. And when it gets to three-eighths of a tank of gas, every single time the engine starts cutting up and, and quits running and, and it starts starving for fuel. Where trash is that? It's got water in the tank. There you no. go. There you go. No. Yeah. If it's pulling it like on a diesel, you'll have this. If it's pulling it through a sock, up a pipe, right? Okay. It's got a hole in that pipe. Oh! See what I'm saying? So if it gets below this hole, you see... It's like when you go to McDonald's and you get your straw, and you cram the straw down and you take it out and put your drink, and yeah. you drink out of the water, and you drink it, and all It's aerated stuff. Yeah, come yeah, flip it over. Yeah, you flip it over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I was a kid in, uh, in school, and this is how long ago I was a kid in school, the straws that we had were made of paper. Paper they were paper. They were paper straws. Yeah, we had paper straws that they gave us, you know, to drink out. Yeah, the straw. I'm serious. We didn't have plastic straws in those days. It was paper, and they were littler. They were smaller than the straws you have now, as far as the diameter of them. Yeah, you have to drink what you're gonna do. I get a little bit of yeah. If you drink, if you if you drink it, it had a little bit of a waxy paper straw and all that, and you know, I'm sure there are people. Have you seen the straw they had at Burger King? Or BK pipe is about to figure out. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Those are cool. All right. Okay, we got uh, we got to move on so we can get through. We got to be we're going to be going to lunch in just a minute. Yeah. Now listen to this. Watch what I'm telling you about. Okay. Um, let's see. Fuel level. I'm thinking. You know, is it supposed to be the right answer? But I don't like that question, and I don't like the choices they're giving me. Technician A says spark knock pinger detonation can be caused by lean air fuel mixture. Is he right? Yeah. Why is he right? Because it's hot. Lean is hot, right? Yeah. And hot makes ping. Uh, technician B said, and anytime somebody tells you that's valve noise, have you ever have you ever called that valve clatter? Mm -hmm. It's not what it is. You knew better than that, didn't you? You know now that it's got nothing to do with the valves. 17. Right? Okay. Yeah, you ain't listening to valves. You're hearing a flame fronts coming together just ringing the piston like a bell. It's got nothing to do with the valves. Um, Why well, don't when I have that voltage and I can hear it? Hear Outstanding for All right, there you go. Um, technician B says an inoperative cooling fan could cause the engine to spark not. Casey, could an inoperative cooling fan cause the engine to spark not? No. Only if Ben worked on it. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Actually, if it runs too, a little too hot. What else happens when it runs a little too hot? It overheats. Besides the overheating. It runs hot. Knocks. 
Yeah. You're going to make knock. Good, Goes above 2,500 degrees. We were cleaning injectors one day on a tempo that was not overheating, but it was running hotter than it should. And Mark Shipes, when he took the injector, he was my helper at the time. Black. He pulled the injector cleaning machine off, and gas goes down there, and the uh, exhaust down there has reached the flash point of the gasoline, and as soon as the gas is dripping out of the injector thing, hits the exhaust, whew, we got a fire going back there. Well, what's Mark doing? He's jumping around. Who? 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 That doesn't do anything to put the fire out. You know what I'm saying? You gotta think, keep your head. You know, about once a year when I was working at the Ford place, I'd set one on fire. So you got to think clearly and put the fire out. You know what I'm saying? Huh? Not really. I mean, I didn't do it on set them on fire on purpose. You know, but you know, but what happens is, you know, the when the water goes, I mean, when the gas goes down there, poof, it catches fire. You got to do something to put it out. Have a fire extinguisher close by. I know where they are. That's why I got to tell y'all during safety orientation where the fire extinguishers are in the shop, so you know right where to go. Uh, so anyway, uh, learn to grab one and use it. That's what they're here for. It makes a mess, but it's better to have a mess than it is to burn the house down. All right. So technician A says a partially, uh, partially stuck open EGR valve can cause ping during wide open throttle engine operation. Sure, why not? Hold on. Anybody want to answer Casey? Oh, yeah, that's true. Casey yeah. goes off half cocked and says, sure, why not? Yeah. All right. Technician B says a partially stuck open EGR valve could cause the engine to stall while operating at idle speed. One of these guys is right, the other one is not. B is right. B is right. So if you got a partially stuck open EGR valve, you're going to have a rough idle. And something that used to happen a lot was you see particles of carbon you know, that were in the exhaust, would get up and they get trapped under the jar. It would try to close and it would trap, it would catch up carbon and it wouldn't seal good and you're running real rough. And uh, if that stuff is in there, if, there, if it's bad enough, you know, if, if your intake has got enough of that stuff caked up in it, the, the vehicle has a tendency to come back. You know, you clean the carbon out best you know how. I used to pull the EGR valve off the car. And I would fire the engine up with the EGR valve off the car and just let it, you know, rev it up a little bit and let it just blow that carbon and crud and all out of there as good as I could. Yeah, that guy told me about light some of the, like, get a torch and light some of the carbon on fire and hit oxidizing it. Yeah, he was talking about the EGR where the EGR goes into the manifold. That's he said if you get it started burning and then hit it with your oxygen, it'll blow the uh, carbon out of there and make and all you'll have is, a, is an ash and all that. It'd be but, pretty. Well, yeah, well, you know... Uh, I know that one guy was doing the torch thing, heating up a bolt, trying to get it out of this one car, and he had a crankcase explosion, you know, because it had missed it. You know, boom! You heard a big boom, and it really, I don't know, I don't remember what it, it damaged it somehow, but it was, you know, um, it didn't blow his head clean off or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, that was, I think that happened too, so. Um, let's see. Uh, technician A says, a two- Rich air fuel mixture can be caused by a defective fuel pressure regulator. True. How? How? What can be wrong with the regulator to cause that? Stuck wide, wide open. If it's stuck wide open, that's going to have low pressure. Oh, well, stuck closed. Stuck, stuck closed, closed could have. Is it possible for it to be intermittently stuck closed? I mean, intermittently stuck closed. I mean, sometimes stuck closed and sometimes not. Yeah. Okay, and uh, what about um, if the diaphragm ruptures in the regulator and fuel goes right through the regulator? You know, you know, I was telling Philip Kirkland, this guy that worked with me out there, had his Jeep Cherokee that had a busted fuel pressure regulator, and it had filled a bunch of the cylinders up with gas. And if it, of course, it hydraulic locks and it won't turn over, you know, so he's going to pull the plugs out. And he's thinking, it's like his Jeep out here, so he unplugs the wires from the distributor, thinking he's killing the ignition system, but he's not because it's got a crank sensor back there. And he's got those spark plug wires laying all over the place, and the plug's out, and he's going to just let it blow the gas out out there in the service mm -hmm. line. And blow. what happened was he wound up, uh, that sparks lit off the gas that was coming up. It looked like an anti-aircraft gun sitting out there, big balls of fire going up into the sky. That's cool. <laughs> it was cool, but it scared the podunk out of him. And I was thinking, you knew better than that. He knew that. I don't know what's the problem. With that. Okay. Oh, okay, so it can be. Technician A is right. Technician B says a defective pressure regulator can cause a too lean air fuel True mixture. Be stuck open. If it's letting the, if the pressure is too low. So, 19 from my perspective, you know, I, the right answer on this is supposed to be A. Uh, and I, I don't know that I've ever seen a too lean air fuel mixture being caused by a fuel pressure regulator. I have personally yeah. seen it. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I'm, if you think about it, in theory, it's possible. The answer key for the benefit of those that are going to, whose test is going to be graded by my work study student is A. 
but I would just concede that you're probably, you know, I can see that, but it almost never, ever happens. I've had it uh, Amanda replaced a fuel pressure regulator on Judy's. What was that would do on Judy's van? You were putting a regulator on it? Was it leaking or? Uh, yeah. Remember that? I can't. I'll think like a uh, gas coming out the little vacuum hose going into the intake. Technician A says an oil analysis by an engineering laboratory can reveal engine problems by measuring the amount of dissolved metals in the oil. What about it? Anybody know? Yeah. Technician B says many engine related problems make a characteristic noise. True. You can taste oil though. You can taste like copper, taste like steel. What's copper taste like? Copper? It tastes like blood. What's, what's steel taste like? It's, it's a less metallic taste. Go ahead and lick a wrench. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Go look at the screwdriver. I had a bag <laughs> in the mountain today. I know exactly how it feels. Now, what if you take some oil and you drip a little bit on, on a paper napkin? You can see it. If it actually, stays, you see stuff wicking away from it, you know, it's either contaminated with fuel or coolant or something. If you drop a, you put a drop of clean, fresh oil on like a paper towel, it'll sit, there. it'll sit there and you won't see anything wicking away from it. If you see stuff wicking away from it, then is there stuff in the oil? You know, so how bad is too bad as far as contamination goes? If it wicks away, it makes a dime size. It's wrong. Yeah. Well, if it if it wicks away from it, there's something in there. Okay. So here's what you got. You got a situation where, um, what if you if you let your oil go too long before you change it, you know what's it typically going to be contaminated with? Gasoline. And soot. And soot. Shaving. Define soot. Uh, soot like. Yeah. What is soot? What is what does soot consist of? Soot is carbon filled up. I mean, where does the carbon come from? The gas being burned. Well, the gas being burned. So the soot is like unburned fuel, right? That's hydrocarbon, right? Hydrocarbons. It'd be mm -hmm. hydrocarbons, probably some gasoline, and probably some metal. What about some water? That too, because you could create a gallon of water. You're, you're making a gallon of water, you're burning a gallon of gas, you know, basically, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, how many gallons of gas do you burn per gallon of uh, fuel? I'm sorry, how many gallons of air do you burn per gallon of gasoline? 10? 100. Huh? No, it's, it's, like it's a lot. Yeah. 9,000 gallons of air per gallon of gas. That's a lot. So what is this 14.7 to 1 thing I'm hearing about? What do you mean? Well, I mean, that's stoichiometric. That's your air-fuel mixture. That's the ratio. By what? I mean, what are we measuring? 14.7 of what? I mean, if, it, if we're burning 9,000 gallons of air per one gallon of gasoline, uh, how does 14.71 figure into that? That's the weight of the air to the Listen to her. She's got her act together. That's by weight. We're talking by volume when we say gallons. We're talking by weight when we say 14.71. So how do engineers measure gasoline? By the pound. By pound. Don't you remember the injectors? 14 yeah. pounds per hour, 19 pounds per hour? That's an engineering thing. Okay, how do they measure uh, the fuel that they pump into a jet aircraft? Pounds? By the ton. Oh, tons? By the ton. They don't measure it by because it holds a lot. I measure by pounds. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want you to mess up and have yeah. 0.2 tons and Quit yeah, you have lots and lots of tons, but you're not going to measure it by the gallon because what you're doing, you, you need to know how much weight you're going to be hauling, right? <laughs> yeah. a little, I have a little dinger. Maybe. Maybe. A little fancy rolls. Right. All right. 